Hello and welcome to this uh, class on uh, the components of a medical linear accelerator. So today we're going to go over um, the components uh, are in, a, in a medical linear accelerator, discuss each one, um, essentially how they work, uh, try to show a few examples of what they look like, uh, and then at the end, the goal will be able to recognize certain types of components and uh, put them in order in, a, in an accelerator and be able to explain um, how they work. So uh, let's get started with a quick, uh, very simple schematic of um, what these components uh, what these components look like. Um, so starting at the very top of this image, uh, what we're looking at here in red is called the primary collimator. So the primary collimator is not really discussed um, too much. Um, it is essentially uh, just a conical hull that um, produces a, a beam of a circular cross-section. So as uh, electrons strike the target and produce a beam of photons, um, the cross-section of that will be uh, a spherical cross-section. So the beam will start off as a circle, a circular cross-section um, and cone shaped and it will diverge downwards. And in order to collimate that to something that doesn't spill out over the sides of the jaws, um, the primary collimator is used. So we're going to discuss each of these components. Um, uh, we're going to start at the top. Uh, so the first one that you would come across would be um, the electron gun. So an electron gun, I have an example of one right here, but it doesn't really kind of uh, tell you too much about what an electron gun uh, does or, or how it works. Uh, but inside there is um, a filament, uh, that filament gets hot, um, electrons are emitted from that. So we'll go into that in more detail. Um, so this is one example of an elect uh, of a um, of an electron gun taken out of a linear accelerator, but uh, you've probably seen something similar to uh, like an X-ray tube, uh, where this this would actually be uh, significantly smaller and only part only a small part of the uh, electron uh, of the electron gun uh, or of the uh, the whole um, assembly. Um, but obviously, we need to produce more uh, more power, more current um, in a linear accelerator. So the next thing. Um, that you would get after that would be, so you, you've produced electrons, uh, you want to accelerate those towards the patient to um, orders of magnitude of uh, millions of electron volts. So, so uh, we'll talk about how, how you go about doing that. And uh, one of the things that is commonly used um, is, is a microwave. Um, and the microwaves are injected into a waveguide with the electrons and then the electrons Sometimes it's described as the electrons riding a wave, just like a surfer rides a wave. Uh, we'll try and we'll try and put a little bit more uh, detail into that and how that works. But essentially, in order to get those electrons moving to energies in the MeV range, uh, we cannot rely on electrostatics just pulling electrons along. The waveguide would have to be very long, and the components very large um, and very high power to get the kind of energies we have. Um, so in order to be able to make that fit into a smaller package, you need uh, microwaves. So what produces the microwaves? Well, uh, in a microwave oven, just as in a medical linear accelerated, the component that produces the microwaves is called the magnetron. So we'll talk about what, how the magnetron works later. Once you've got a microwaves and electrons from the electron gun, they go into a waveguide. Um, there are different types of waveguide um, within uh, a, a, a linear accelerator, um, and they can. If you if you open the door and you look inside an, an accelerator, you'll see um, you'll see these uh, copper tubes, and they are they are waveguides. They are things that direct um, RF power uh, microwaves into the accelerator structure. But the one component that we generally call the waveguide is the accelerator structure. The the thing that actually um, uh, has the electrons and the microwaves injected into it and accelerates them to energies in the order of MeV. So that is the waveguide. Um, strictly speaking, it is the accelerator structure. Um, but uh, that's called a waveguide and also the pipes that send the RF power from the magnetron into um, the klystron or the waveguide are also called waveguide because that is exactly what they are. Um, they're usually shaped like copper tubes but they have a, uh, generally have a, a rectangular cross-section 
and they can bend throughout the machine to direct the power. So that's the, 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 the different types of waveguides um, in, 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 that you'll see inside a medical accelerator. And I'm not just talking about the difference between a, a standing wave and a, a traveling wave, I'm talking about the difference between the actual accelerator column and the, the pipes that lead the microwaves into that. Uh, another component that you're going to need uh, along there is the bending magnet, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We're also going to talk about scattering files and our flattening filters, iron chambers. We can briefly talk about uh, mirrors inside the machine. And then at the, the very end, when we talked about all of the components that you need for a linear accelerator, there's one that we don't talk about. Um, the, that will be the um, thyotron. And so I'll show you an example of a, of a thyotron. So the electron gun um, is uh, the part of the accelerator that produces a beam of electrons. And those uh, electrons don't have to be of a particularly high energy KV, maybe in the KV range, um, but they are emitted from a um, hot filament. Uh, the filament gets hot, releases electrons, uh, those electrons would basically just be emitted from the surface, but then fall back down to the surface of the wire. Um, if it was not for the fact that there is uh, an electric field drawing them off the surface. So in this example um, that I showed here, uh, we have the hot filament, but what is not really shown here is how the electrons are drawn away from this. And so for this, you need um, some electrostatics, you need um, uh, an anode, uh, maybe multiple anodes, and obviously the electrons are going to be drawn to, uh, towards the anode. Uh, then you may need some sort of focusing. So in this particular uh, diagram that's shown here, this is actually taken from a cathode ray tube. Um, and uh, before the invention of flat screen monitors, uh, this was essentially how all TVs worked, oscilloscopes, things like that. Um, but there was an electron beam that scanned across the screen, and there was a phosphor coating on that screen. Um, and so the, the actual, the widest part of this image here is showing how the beam would be moved around um, by electric fields. Um, so we don't really need that. All we need to do is produce electrons, pull them away uh, from the hot filament um, so that they're not drawn back to the hot filament, which is what would naturally happen. Because uh, you think of um, a, a standard old fashioned light bulb, this would also produce electrons, but the electrons are not able to be drawn away from the surface because there's there's no electric field. Um, also, obviously this is the same principle that is used in a diagnostic x-ray tube. Um, they're just the acceleration part is nowhere near as complicated in a diagnostic tube. Okay, so going back to our picture, um, putting all these components in order, we talked about the primary collimator up at the top in red. Um, way up at the top, you would also have your uh, target. So the target would actually be uh, right up at the top um, just at the top of the, uh, the, the primary collimator. So where the primary collimator seems to come to a peak, that's where the target would be. Um, in the case of electron mode, obviously that target is removed and the electrons go through the primary collimator. Um, scattering files and, and flattening filters we're gonna talk about. Uh, this diagonal line that goes um, through, the, through this image here is actually um, the light field mirror. Uh, in, not in all accelerators is it positioned here, uh, but it is uh, not uncommon for the mirror to be um, semi-transparent, meaning that the beam can, trans can travel through it because it's a thin, uh, essentially a thin, shiny film. Uh, the beam goes through it, but a light bulb uh, positioned off to the side would shine light um, onto the mirror and then down to the patient. Uh, whereas the beam can just shine straight through it without hardly any attenuation effect. Um, the next components would be the, the secondary and tertiary collimators. So we talked about how this thing right up at the top in red is the primary collimator. Anything else after that obviously has to be secondary or tertiary collimation. So normally what we refer to as secondary collimation means jaws. So we're able to make rectangular fields with jaws. Tertiary collimator would be the MLCs. Now, there's different designs here, so not all, not all accelerators use um, jaws and MLCs um, in the same structure that is shown here. Uh, in this particular machine, this was uh, an older Elector machine, um, an Elector uh, SL series precise machine, where the MLCs were actually above the jaws. 
and below that there was an additional jaw that um, stopped any interleaf leakage uh, um, from going through the MLCs down to the patient. Uh, that jaw didn't need to be very thick. It was essentially just called a backup jaw because it essentially just backed up the MLCs. Um, and then there was the jaw underneath that, which was considerably thicker um, because that was the direction that the, the MLCs were not moving. So combination of MLCs and jaw makes one uh, collimation from one side, and then the jaw on the other side brings in the collimation from the other side. Uh, and obviously this can produce uh, MLC shaped defined fields. Some, some uh, new, the newer electors, uh, I believe, um, do not have the backup jaw anymore. Um, so there's just a MLC and uh, another jaw. And then if you, if you compare this then to um, uh, a true beam or any, any variant really, um, you actually have two sets of jaws and then the MLC is actually underneath. So basically like this, but flipped, but flipped over. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the webguide here. We're not gonna get into um, a lot of the details. Uh, there's some good information online now about how um, waveguides uh, wave work. Um, but essentially they fall into two categories, um, standing waveguides and um, traveling wave, traveling wave waveguides. So at this point we are talking about the, the waveguide, the accelerator uh, column structure that is typically located um, at the top of the gantry. So where the gantry goes across before it bends down towards the patient. Um, that is typically where the accelerator structure is located, um, at least in a, in a C-arm style, again, a C -arm style um, conventional linear accelerator. Uh, in some more unconventional accelerators, uh, like uh, maybe a tomotherapy style machine or a um, S-wave uh, uh, accelerator, uh, like on a cyber knife, um, the, obviously the, the way the components are oriented is different. Um, but in, in the typical run-of-the-mill accelerator that we typically see in a radiation oncology clinic, where there is a machine at the back, um, a large gantry that goes out, and then a head that goes down onto the patient, the, the waveguide is usually up in that head. And we're talking about something that's maybe of the order of uh, four feet long. Um, so, it's, so it's up there at the top. Um, so uh, yeah, so we, we break it down into um, traveling with. Uh, and uh, standing wave. So pictures here show um, a traveling wave guide uh, where the, the, beam, the energy actually increases as you go down the wave guide. And as that happens, the, the distance between the irises changes, uh, I guess the distance between them gets longer as the energy in increases. Um, so that would be an example of a, uh, of a traveling wave guide. Uh, obviously the alternative is a standing wave guide. Um, where the, the beam actually um, bounces backwards and forwards and uses constructive inter interference. Uh, one advantage of these is that these kind of waveguides can be a little bit shorter. Um, it's uh, both kinds are used in common modern linear accelerators. Uh, one typical design is this one here, which is um, with side coupled cavities. Um, so these, these uh, squares here, are the side, uh, the side cavities. Um, the beam is actually going down uh, through the middle. Uh, sorry, the squares are actually like connections between the cavities. Uh, the kind of hemicircles, the hemispheres are, um, uh, are the side cavities themselves. So the cavities are um, mounted um, around the, 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 the part the where the beam goes through straight through the middle. And uh, these, these uh, cavities are coupled together. Um, and uh, Varian has a pretty neat feature where they can adjust um, uh, how this coupling works uh, in a way that can actually um, produce different energies without changing the length of the waveguide. So if you think about it, a standing wave waveguide um, should produce a single energy, um, but it is able, you, the Varian is able to produce multiple energies um, by changing how these cavities uh, are coupled together and therefore changing, uh, changing the wavelength. So that's very, that is obviously a very brief uh, overview of how um, accelerator structures work. Um, 
and you know the, there's more there's more information out there uh, on youtube about uh, how, how they work in more details so i encourage you to um, to look for videos uh, on that i just want to give you a, a brief overview of all components uh, maybe we'll come back to the web guide and go into into more details in a later video so bending magnets so the next thing that you need in order to get that high you know so you know you've got a beam of high energy electrons uh it's currently going down that gantry uh, and if we don't do anything, it's going to go straight over the patient's head uh, and through the wall at the other side of the room. So we obviously need to bend that beam uh, bend through 90 degrees and get them get it down onto the patient. Uh, and so in this uh, in this picture uh, that I snatched from uh, Google uh, Google Images, uh, just shows a basic linear accelerator with the beam um, pointing down, uh, going through a carousel which holds all the flattening filters, and then going down through the beam shaping collimator, the secondary and tertiary collimators before hitting the patient. Um, but let's, let's go into a little bit more detail about the bending magnets, yeah, just a little bit more detail. So they typically um, are not 90 degree bending magnets. They do bend their beam from this angle to that angle. So ultimately ended up in a 90 degree bend, um, but they're uh, typically 270 degree bending magnets, meaning, uh, well, with another picture here, showing that the beam actually goes around and then down. Um, I believe that's actually an older style. I've never actually seen a bending magnet that does look like this 270 degree bending magnet. Um, the more modern accelerators that I've come across have 270 degree bending magnets by taking a 90 degree bend a 90 degree bend in the opposite direction and then a 90 degree bend back again. So it's actually more of a longer, straighter uh, bending magnet. Um, but the effect is um, to, to get the beam to bend 90 degrees, but to do it in a way that is actually 270 degrees. But it is not just um, 270 degrees like this. So the reason that we don't use the 90 degree bending magnet shown up at the top is that you get um, uh, chromatic uh, distribution so the actual higher energy and the lower energy electrons uh, would actually be affected differently by the bending magnet. The higher energies would go further out towards the foot of the patient uh, and the lower energies would be bent further in towards the head of the patient so that's not good we want the beam to be focused uh, and so the 270 degree bending magnet keeps that uh, focused such that it doesn't matter whether the beam has a higher or lower energy, um, it will still bend through 270, degree, 270 degrees and not be um, dispersed. Uh, the bending magnets are typically control, computer controlled. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the ion chamber later on, but the ion chamber is more than just a device for counting the photons and making sure that the output is correct. It's also has the ability to re-steer the beam as necessary. So if there's a problem with these bending magnets, if the current to the bending magnets fluctuates and that causes the beam to be steered differently from the head of the table to the foot of the table, um, the bending magnets will have a feedback loop that comes from the ion chamber and the ion chamber sends a signal back to the bending magnets and says, hey, you know, you're bending uh, towards the foot of the table, you need to come back towards the head of the table. And uh, that feedback loop is constantly working throughout the whole time that the beam is on. And the whole point of doing that is such that we get a nice flat and symmetric beam. Um, so we currently in the state of Ohio use TG142. It's kind of like the law of the land that we follow TG142. And um, our beams uh, must be uh, within 1% of baseline, meaning that they are one within 1% 1 uh, across 80% of the beam width um, from whatever it was measured to be a commissioning. So if we had a 6x flat field, then whatever the flatness of that field was at the time of commissioning, it has to be within 1% of that. And also within the symmetry also has to be within 1%. So the whole, base, the whole profile has to be um, within this 80% has to be within 1% of our baseline. Um, the reason it's 1% from baseline rather than a very specific number of, for flatness, but we can obviously quantify the flatness of this beam by, by looking at the, um, whether the beak, uh, beam is pointed in the middle or dipped in the middle, comparing the edges to the middle, 
um, one minus the other would give us a value for the flatness of the field. Obviously, if there's no dip or peak in the middle, then there's no difference between that and the edge and the flatness is perfect, so zero. Uh, zero percent. Um, if it's peaked in the middle or dipped in the middle, then the flatness could be up to maybe three percent um, for a regular beam. Uh, but we really don't care what that value is anymore because now we have beams that are flattening filter free and thereby not they are naturally peaked on a central axis to give a higher dose width on central axis. So it's no longer we're no longer able to say the beam should be flat within 3% because our flattening filter-free beams were never intended to be flat within 3%. So now we use TG142, which says, doesn't matter what the flatness was originally, just make sure it's the same now. And so it's within 1% of, uh, of the baseline. Um, we can do the same thing with symmetry. Uh, and again, the, we're talking about that bending magnet, the bending magnet, at least in the gun target direction, which controls the beam going from the head to the foot of the patient. Um, that bending magnet can be controlled to re-steer the symmetry back to what we want it to be, which is obviously symmetric. So beams can be uh, designed to be not flat, but they should be always symmetric. And so um, the symmetry of the beam should always come out to be approximately zero. Um, and obviously our tolerance is 1% from baseline, but when we capture that baseline, we want it to be symmetric. Um, at least ideally, there's no good reason why a beam should be uh, asymmetric when the machine is uh, essentially straight out of the box. But that is how we measure it. Uh, we measure flatness and symmetry, both of those at 10 centimeters. Um, so um, uh, you can obviously measure flatness and symmetry at any depth, but just to standardize everything, um, 10 is considered to be uh, at least a double APM standards where we should have uh, the, our baselines uh, set. So um, uh, flattening files and scattering, uh, sorry, flattening filters and scattering files both work in a, in a very similar way. Uh, the, the idea is to take a, be a beam that would normally have a Gaussian distribution, spatially, um, where it's peaked in the center uh, with less, uh, less, just less of the edges. So that, uh, that is because our electron beam is distributed like that. It's, the electron beam is, uh, has a full width half maximum of about one millimeter, but there's more intense in the center and less of the, of the edges. Um, when the electron beam strikes the target and produces Bremsstrahlung, uh, that Bremsstrahlung will also have a Gaussian distribution. Uh, it will get broader and broader as it goes down towards the patient if we didn't have a flattening filter in there. So the flattening filter then um, uh, attenuates the beam on the central axis um, and, and has less attenuation around the edges. So I've got an example of a flattening filter, uh, flattening filter here. Uh, this is one taken out of an old machine. Um, this one, I believe, was a 10 MB or maybe a 15 MB flattening filter, uh, but it has a rather serious peak on the central axis. You know, you'll notice the size of this. Um, this the, the diameter of this gives you some indication of where it is positioned in the machine. Um, by the time the machine exits, uh, sorry, by the time the beam exits the machine, it has been collimated down uh, to a rectangular shaped field. But we know that we can produce 40 by 40 fields. So if we trace that back, it gets smaller and smaller as it goes towards the target. Up at the, up at the actual target itself, we consider the source of photons to be essentially a pint source. But of course, in reality, it's about a one millimeter diameter beam. Um, and that beam diverges as it gets further and further away from the target. So components that are mounted closest to the target um, will have a circular cross section because up there, any time above the jaws, the beam is circular in cross section. And um, the closer it is to the target, the smaller it's going to be. Um, so this has a, you know, a reasonable diameter of um, about eight centimeters. Just eyeballing that, just looking at this, it's about eight centimeters. It's meant to be quite high up in the machine on a carousel and our machines can produce multiple energies, but every one has to have a different flattening filter. A 6 MB flattening filter or a 4 MB flattening filter will have this pyramid bump in the middle, but it will be less pronounced because a 6 MB beam is not as highly peaked in the center as a 10 or 15 or 18 MB beam. 
high energy beams such as 18 or 20 MV photons will typically have something like this with a additional filter um, that has a similar shape on the opposite side. So instead of being a pyramid shape, it's actually a diamond shape, two pyramids stuck together. And that is needed for, in order to attenuate um, the, the, the beam on the central axis because the higher the energy of the beam, the more peaked it's going to be on the central axis, meaning the spatial distribution is gonna be more intense on the central axis than it is uh, at, the, at the edges, especially so for higher energies. Um, that actually, the, the, the differing thickness of these flattening filters actually explains why our high dose rate beams um, get higher and higher in dose rate when the flattening filter is removed. If you remove a 6 MV flattening filter from a machine capable of producing 600 MU per minute with a flattening filter, uh, if you remove that flattening filter, the dose rate is going to be higher on the central axis um, for, for beams that have a thicker flattening filter. So when you remove this flattening filter from a 6 MV beam, you can get up to 1400 MU, MUs per minute, at least on a varying machine. But if you remove this flattening filter from the 10 MV beam, which is more peaks on the central axis, then you end up with more dose rate on the central axis. And that, therefore the dose rate on the central axis jumps up to 2400 from 1400, from 600 MUs per minute. Uh, between the 6X, 6 6 F, and 10 F um, uh, beams. So the higher dose rates come from the fact that the flattening filter is very different. Nothing to do with the actual um, properties of the beam itself, or at least the way the beam is manufactured in, in, in the waveguide. Uh, the higher dose rate is simply a, a consequences of removing um, this flattening filter. Um, so we were, this slide shows, we we're talking about scattering filters. So what is a scattering, a scattering file? Uh, a scattering file is the electron version of a, of a flattening filter, and it is going to um, uh, flatten an electron beam. Now, flattening an electron beam is nowhere near as difficult um, as flattening um, a, a photon field. Uh, it takes a lot less to get that Gaussian distribution to be a lot to be flat, um, to be flatter a lot less material. If you were to put an electron beam through this steel flattening filter, the end result would be almost nothing. You would have no beam left. Uh, and it certainly wouldn't be necessarily that much flatter. However, if you were to use this uh, aluminum or aluminum backing plate that is, that, that is basically just a protection for this thing, um, that would do a much more jo better job of, of, of making the electron beam um, flatter. So. Scattering files for electrons tend to be um, just pretty small disks uh, with maybe a little bit of a bump on them to produce uh, a flat electron beam. Um, they're generally made of something like copper, uh, not as high density as something like steel um, because we don't want to attenuate the electron beam too much, we just want to flatten it out. So this picture here um, has two purposes. It shows you kind of what the, where the scattering file is located. It's going to be up in a carousel somewhere inside the machine. Uh, it's going to be quite, probably quite high up. Uh, in electron machines, at least the older ones that I used to work with, there was a scat the scattering files were very small, meaning they were mounted way up by the target. Um, on a barium machine, there may only be one carousel that holds all the filters and um, scattering files, in which case the scattering files are going to need to be about as, the same diameter um, as this flattening filter. Um, but essentially they do the same job. Also shown in this image is kind of an idea of uh, that virtual point source. So why our um, electrons don't follow the inverse square law very well um, is because um, well, one, they don't act like, uh, they don't really follow in the square law because of the properties of electrons, that's true. Um, but also there's uh, an issue with where is the actual um, source of the electrons and it's not actually at the same point as the entrance window. If you trace back the electrons um, to where they appear to come from after they've gone through the scattering file, uh, that point is usually below um, the exit window of the accelerator, uh, meaning that the, um, uh, distance between the source and uh, the patient is, is technically less than 100 um, for, for electrons, at least if you match the electrons back using divergence principles.
So the, the, one of the other components inside the head, uh, trying to do this in order from top to bottom. Uh, so we talked about the, uh, the flattening filter, uh, the scattering files. Um, the next thing you're gonna need to have after that is something like this. This is a um, iron chamber. Uh, this iron chamber has protective covers taken off. It's actually got um, a kind of drum skin. Uh, they are very sensitive. Um, you could very easily put your hand straight through this. It's very, very soft, very brittle. Um, but essentially the beam goes through this. It's hardly attenuated at all. And it has um, uh, a gas build component that acts like uh, any other type of ion chamber, measures ionization of the gas with an electric field to pull electrons from the ionized air towards um, a plate, um, count the electrons, and therefore it is able to count the amount of ionization in here. That The amount of ionization is gonna be proportional to how much um, uh, how much is going through here. Uh, it has to be able to work for electron beams and photon fields, photon beams. Um, and it also, uh, it's difficult for me to show you this, uh, but if you were to look at this closely in, in person, uh, you would see that it actually has um, a quadrant shape to it. In other words, there is uh, a central part, which is the primary ion chamber. There is a ring around it, which is the secondary ion chamber. So the, the machine can actually um, measure the output twice using two different independent ion chambers. But the quadrants allow it to detect the beam steering. So if the beam is steered towards the head of the patient and the ion chamber is like orientated like this and the head of the, head of the gantry is here, um, then on this side of the ion chamber, there will be more charge than on the opposite side of the ion chamber. Uh, the machine also has the capability to steer the beam a little bit from the left to right side of the table. Um, and so there is feedback that goes to those bending magnets. So we've only talked about the primary bending magnet, which bends towards the patient. Um, uh, there is actually some ability to steer the beam left to right. Uh, and of course, both of those types, of, both of those bending magnets have to be controlled from feedback. So the feedback comes from uh, this chamber. So this, this is a very critical component of the machine. It, it is what is calibrated to measure your output. It is what is your safety feature to uh, stop us from, if the primary electrometer fails, we have a backup. And it is always working when the beam is on to not only count the, um, the amount of ionization or the amount of beam going through this in order to stop the beam at the correct point. Um, but it is also uh, intended to steer and uh, be able to steer the beam. So that is the monitor ion chamber or the monitor chamber. Um, so moving down towards the patient, um, we're gonna skip the mirror. Uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier that's because the mirror could be in different positions. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, after the iron chamber and before the MLCs. Uh, MLCs and jaws, we've talked about how they can be in different positions. Um, there's also the possibility that your machine could have additional MLCs, maybe for stereotactic um, treatments where it's actually a bolt-on MLC that goes to the bottom of the machine. So the machine could end up with, maybe your machine has, um, uh, 10 millimeter or five millimeter uh, MLCs, um, but you want to treat with a finer resolution than that. So you maybe have two or three millimeter MLCs bolted on as an, an addition. So, you know, obviously these can be in various, various different arrangements for different machine designs. Um, but we'll just talk about the MLCs from a very general point of view. So for most people working in radiation oncology now, at least the younger people in radiation oncology, the MLCs is pretty much the only thing they're gonna know. But prime, before MLCs, we used to shape the field uh, with custom CeraVen blocks. So blocks that were um, shaped to match the shape of the lesion um, from the given gantry angle. If you change the gantry angle, let's say you treated the patient with two or three or four fields, every field would obviously have to have its own unique uh, block because the shape of the target would be different. Um, but other than, and, and they're un obviously unique to the patient, but other than that, they're not very um, flexible. They're um, shaped for a single patient, for a single gantry angle. After that, they have to be melted down and reused. 
Um, so there was definitely disadvantages of using those um, style of blocks. Other disadvantages included the fact that they were made out of toxic material that needed to be handled in order to mount the blocks to the machine, or um, and you had to fabricate these blocks, which took a little bit of time. Um, and also there was additional cost in, in uh, having the materials and the space designated for the construction of these blocks. And once you've made them, uh, they could not be modified. So if you needed to adjust the plan in any way, uh, unless you could reposition the block, uh, if it needed to be a different shape or a different size, maybe the tumor shrunk and you needed the block to, um, to, to take that into account, it had to be remade. Um, MLCs, on the other hand, have none of those disadvantages. Oh, there's one I missed right up at the top. Um, there's always the possibility that that big, heavy cerebellum block could be dropped. Um, and if the patient happened to be on your foot, if the patient or your foot happened to be underneath it when it landed, um, that would be very bad news. These things were, were very heavy because they're made out of a material uh, not too dissimilar from lead. And they were very bulky. Um, so maybe um, they were about um, eight to 10, maybe 12 centimeters thick. So very, we're talking lots and lots of high, high density, heavy metal. Um, maybe smaller therapists would not be able to handle the weight of this. So lots and lots of disadvantages, lots of problems um, arising from MLCs, uh, but obviously, sorry, from arising from custom cerebellum blocks. But obviously, this is what um, the um, the uh, field of radiation oncology used for for decades, um, and was a significant advancement of just using. Um, uh, symmetric or asymmetric jaws to shape the field. So uh, it's a step up from that, but obviously the ability to um, produce MLCs that can shape the, ML, uh, shape the field in any way we want almost um, uh, is an advantage. So we use MLCs today to replace those. So we've talked about the differences. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the design of the MLCs. They're not all the same. Um, Oh, I guess I missed that slide. Okay, so uh, we, we can get back to that. But uh, essentially, jaw, uh, jaws and MLCs could either have rounded edges or flat edges. Um, in most machines, it's a combination, actually. So the, the jaws might be, uh, one of the jaws might have flat edges and one of the jaws might have rounded edges. Um, MLCs tend to have the rounded edge. Uh, and the reason for that is, is to do with um, is to do with divergence matching. Um, when you have a small field of radiation, uh, the beam is shaped like this. And when you have a large field of radiation, the divergence means that the beam edge has to be um, wider, but also angled differently. Um, and so, match, making that angle. Uh, change means that the jaws have to be mounted, or the MLCs, if if if, the, if that may be the case. Um, after MLCs that are mounted to the head uh, for as for stereotactic purposes, uh, additional MLC attachments tend to be also mounted like this, where they can where they can collimate the, the beam better. Um, but you usually have a combination of those. So jaws that move on a on a curved track take up more space inside the machine. So if we had all of the MLCs and all of the jaws moving like this, that would take up a lot of space inside the machine. So usually at least one of the jaws and maybe the MLCs also uh, just moves in a, in a, on, a, on a linear track. But in order for the divergence to match for small fields and large fields, since we can't change this angle, uh, they have to be rounded at the edges. Um, so if you see rounded edges, that means the jaws or MLCs are moving on a linear track. If you see that the jaws are perfectly straight at the edges, that means they're moving on a, um, on a curved track. Um, so those are the different uh, designs. Oh, here we go. The, the picture I was looking for all of a sudden reappears. Um, so this is just showing the, the divergence principles of um, uh, rounded versus uh, um, straight edge jaws. Uh, obviously, the rounded edges have more transmission penumbra because the beam can travel um, through the rounded uh, rounded tip uh, and produce a, a little bit more of a penumbra. So that would be the what we would call the transmission uh, penumbra from the rounded edges. So 
Um, Penumbra is not necessarily as big of a thing as it used to be. Uh, Cobalt 60 machines used to have, uh, and I mean the traditional Cobalt 60 machines, not things like the Gamma Knife. Um, but they had very significant penumbras because the physical size of the sauce was much larger than what it is now. So we mentioned earlier that the physical size of the sauce is determined by the width of the electron beam. And the width of that electron beam is typically about one millimeter for width half maximum. So it is almost a point sauce. If you have a point sauce, then you won't suffer from this kind of penumbra. So this kind of geometric penumbra is caused by the fact that photons emitted from one side of the source compared to photons emitted from the other side of the source could be different. Now, if the beam of electrons coming from our linear accelerator was five centimeters wide, as opposed to the one millimeter that it is, then we would also have this problem with linear accelerators. The target would produce photons on one side that would diverge you, that would travel towards one side of the patient differently than they would travel towards the other side of the patient and the distances would be different and therefore we would get this penumbra. So it is possible to be able to calculate this penumbra for any machine if you know um, the distance between the source and the collimating system and then the collimating system in the skin. Um, and you can measure um, what the size of the uh, penumbra would be level P on this um, uh, on this uh, picture here. And what we can we can two things we can take away from this. You can reduce the column. You can reduce that penumbra by making the size of the saw smaller, or by putting the collimators closer to the skin. So the modern linear accelerator, the source is probably about as small as it's going to get with a one millimeter diameter. Um, so we've already got that down pretty low. And you'll notice that with things like stereotactic conical attachments for treating brain lesions, those, those um, cylindrical collimators that we bolt to the head of the machine, those are much closer to the patient. And so we can reduce this um, penumbra further and make very, very um, steep dose drop off between the actual dose in the field and the dose uh, at the edge of the field. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about wedges, but just this is basically just to give you an idea about the different types you may come across. Obviously, the traditional style of wedge, um, and, and you, may, you may not see these anymore. Uh, more and more accelerators are being sold without physical wedges because they're quite cumbersome to use. Um, it's additional work for the therapist to set them up, um, whereas uh, automated wedges are obviously uh, can be set up in the machine and programmed, so there's no way they can be missed um, or orientated incorrectly. Um, but solid wedges were essentially the staple um, for decades before um, other types of wedging came along. Um, now there are two types of soft wedge, meaning not physical wedge. Uh, one of them is the variant system of uh, dynamic wedge uh, or enhanced dynamic wedge, EDW. Um, the E just re essentially represents that there has been changes over the years to make this system work a little bit better. But an uh, EDW that you will find in most modern um, variant machines um, uses the jaws. So the jaw actually sweeps across, across the field. Um, the longer it's in the field, the steeper the wedge angle you're going to get. Um, and the alternative to that is a motorized physical wedge inside the machine. And so Electi uses this option. Um, and, and, and amazingly still, they've actually managed to make, if you ever compare a variant on an Electi machine side by side, you'll see that the head of the machine on an Electi is smaller, which is amazing considering that the Electi machine also has an additional wedge inside it that the variant machine doesn't have. Um, but inside that compact package of an Electi machine, inside that head, is a uh, essentially a physical wedge that looks like this. This is actually one that was removed from an Electa SL25, uh, and it's going to be the same in any old of the older precise machines. I'm not sure what it looks like in the newer, like Synergy type machines, um, but it's probably not really changed significantly. Uh, but the principle of the motorized wedge is very simple. If you put the motorized wedge in, you get a 60 degree wedge. If you take it out, you get zero degree wedge. If you want any other angle between zero and 60, you just change the amount of time that the wedge is in the field. And you can produce any wedge angle you want between the maximum of 60 
and uh, um, uh, and uh, zero where the wedge is completely removed. And it's on a sliding tray, so it can move in and out uh, in and out of the beam. Uh, the beam generally has to stop for this uh, for this wedge to transition into the field. Uh, but that's just a very quick rundown of all of the different wedges. And that's, so that takes us to the end of the presentation. Um, so I've shown you um, what a flattening filter looks like, a real one, uh, what an iron chamber looks like, uh, what an electron gun might look like, although that wasn't particularly useful. Um, we, we lost the slide on Klystron, unfortunately, so let's, let's uh, see if we can talk about Klystron since that was supposed to be in the presentation, but uh, the Klystron disappeared. So um, I'm gonna see if I can go back and find it because it seems to be that these slides kind of just like appear and disappear randomly. So Klystron, oh, there's flattening filter. See that one just kind of disappeared from the talk. That also disappeared. That disappeared. <laughs> Um, so maybe somewhere in here we'll find Klystron. Yes, Klystron. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the Klystron. Oh, Magnetron. Shoot, let's start with Magnetron first. So we completely missed that. Wow, this, this talk is like going backwards now. Okay, so the Magnetron. Uh, so we have an example of this uh, here that you can take a look at, but this, this is the picture. These are the pictures that show everything that you need to know. Um, so if you look inside a Magnetron, remember the Magnetron is what produces microwaves. It's not intended to be a high energy microwave producer, um, but due to, I'll just say patent issues, Varian, does, Varian um, owns the patent for Klystrons, and so Electron, Electra just refuses to use it. Um, and so Electra instead uses magnetrons. Um, their magnetrons are kind of like stretched to the limit of what a magnetron can do. Um, so they tend to fail a little bit more regularly. And so this component might get replaced a little bit more commonly in an electron machine than it would in a variant. At least that's my guess because of the fact that it's being um, pushed quite hard. But electron machines are obviously capable of producing very high energies like 18, 20, 25 MV photons. So how does this thing work? So this is the magnetron supply. This, sorry, this is the microwave supply. This is what either produces the micro, uh, microwaves or uh, in a variant produces and produce and also makes the high energies uh, microwaves. So how does this work? So we'll talk a little bit. That okay, good. My slides are going in the right order now. So the principle of um uh, of a magnetron is that you have again, just like in an electron gun, a hot filament in the center. The hot filament um, boils off electrons. Um, those electrons would file, fall back down to the filament but they are pulled away by an electric field. So the electric field pulls them from the center towards the out, outer edge of that ring. So the outer edge is an anode, which draws the electrons towards them. However, there is also a magnetic field um, that goes uh, in this picture, it's the blue lines going um, in the plane perpendicular to the direction that the, electric, uh, that the electrons are traveling. And we know um, from the right hand rule that if you have an electron moving um, in one direction and you apply a magnetic field perpendicular to that, that is gonna cause the um, electron to move in a circular path. So what happens is these electrons, they go over the surface of those outer cavities. So if you imagine, if you take um, a soda bottle partially filled or be a bottle, personal preference, and you blow over it, you can get a tone. You can get noise um, that has a certain tone. And if you want to change the tone of that sound, you can change the volume of the cavity. So if you make the cavity bigger, you get um, a lower tone, a lower pitch. And if you make the cavity smaller, you get a higher pitch. And so by controlling the size of that cavity and the opening, you can essentially how things like pipe organs work, um, you can uh, produce different tones. So the analogy for that in this case is that the electrons are blowing over the opening of the cavity inside the magnetron, but instead of producing sound, they produce another frequency that happens to be microwaves. And by, so by tuning these cavities to a certain size, we can produce um, three gigahertz microwaves. Why three gigahertz? 
I guess it's just a historical preference. Back when radar was invented in the 1940s, um, magnetrons were invented to, uh, for that application and three gigahertz became uh, a standard. And um, linear accelerators that utilized uh, microwave power supplies uh, in decades later ended up using the same magnetrons from, from radar, I guess, so they ended up being three gigahertz. Uh, but essentially, that is where our microwaves come from. So microwaves come out of this magnetron because of the fact that electrons are blowing over the surface of cavities and sounding off in the, in, in, um, the frequency range of, of microwaves. And so that's how we get our microwaves. And, and in, in an electron machine, that's it. That's what you've got. That is your, magnet, that is your um, where your high, high energy microwaves come from. In, an elect in a variant machine, however, the magnetron is only expected to produce low energy microwaves and they need to be amplified to produce high energy microwaves. So in a variant, um, you will find a device called a klystron. Um, and as I mentioned, um, variant actually owns the patent for, for making klystrons, um, which is why they exist in variant machines. Um, Essentially, the basic principle of how this works is that electrons are injected into a tube uh, in bunches and they move down this tube. Um, they're moved in at a high velocity and they drift through the tube and then they are decelerated. Now, we know that when things are decelerated, they have to somehow lose energy. So if you slam on the brakes in your car, that kinetic energy is converted to heat in the brakes, which is why your brakes have to be made of thick disks of metal, uh, maybe converted into sound in the form of squealing brakes, um, but generally heat. So the principle of um, a klystron is to decelerate electrons and convert that, the, because of the frequency of the bunches, um, that dictates that the frequency of the um, microwave, the, the power that is released ends up being in the microwave band again. So we end up producing, um, low, the low energy microwaves go into the klystron. Um, they're mixed with the electrons in the buncher. Uh, they drift down when they decelerate, they have the same frequency as the low energy microwaves that went in and they end up being, um, uh, the energy of the electrons is converted to high energies, uh, higher energies or higher amplitude microwaves, but of the same frequency of what, as what was injected in. So that's a basic idea of how um, a cholesterol works. So now I think we've covered everything. So let's just go through my slides again to make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, we didn't talk about the targets. Um, so let's just do that real quick. Uh, obviously, now we have completely lost track of like what order the thing, the, these components go in. So maybe it would be a good idea to go back to the beginning, and look from top to bottom, and point them all out again. But the target sits at the top. It's only used for photons, uh, and we all know that electrons strike the target, um, and the photons are produced by Bremsstrahlung. We also know that Bremsstrahlung interaction is not very efficient. Um, for every 99 electrons that strike the target, only one is going to be converted into a branch long photon. The other 99 are gonna be converted into that kinetic energy of those high energy electrons is gonna get converted into a heat and a lot of heat. So we've obviously gone to a lot of trouble to accelerate those um, electrons to very high energies. Their kinetic energy is very high. And when they lose that kinetic energy, it has to get converted into something. And if only 1% of it is going into branch long, then that produces a lot of heat. So our targets, have to be made of something pretty tough that's um, not going to melt. So we use a high Z material, high Z because um, the Bremsstrahlung interaction is more likely to occur, even though 1% is pretty unlikely. Uh, that percentage would be even less if we didn't use a high Z material. So if we think about what high Z materials we're, we know of, lead is one, yeah, that's not good, it melts. Gold, yeah, also melts. Uranium, not so good because it's radioactive, so we don't get irradiated even when the beam is off. Uh, what we're left with, um, well, most, another one that's fairly common is tungsten. Tungsten is at least fairly abundant and not radioactive, high melting point and high Z. So it's, it's pretty much what we need. So the target's made of tungsten. The actual target is only needs to be quite small. 
So we talked about how that electron beam is only one millimeter wide. So how big does the target need to be? So really only it needs to be just a bit bigger than one millimeters. How thick does it need to be? Well, that's a good question. The thicker you make the tungsten target, the more Gramstrom you will get. And the less chance that an electron will go down and hit the patient. But uh, the disadvantage is that you will self-absorb some of that Gramstrom. And so um, the optimum thickness of the tungsten turns out to be about one millimeter. Now, if you put um, a one millimeter sheet of tungsten um, that was very small in a beam of high intensity electrons uh, within not too much time, you would heat soak that small piece of tungsten um, and it would melt. Even with, the, uh, even with the high melting point of that tungsten, uh, it would cause damage. So you need to have that tungsten mounted on a slab of something that can dissipate the heat. And that something is uh, copper. So the tungsten target actually sits on a slab of much thicker copper. The copper is lower Z, so it doesn't really have much interaction going on with the uh, bremstolung. Uh, it's less dense, so it doesn't attenuate the, the bremstolung photons that are produced. It can also stop and scatter some of those electrons that make it through the one millimeter of tungsten um, uh, to stop those uh, high energy electrons getting down directly to the patient by scattering them off to the side. And so copper has many advantages in that case. And it can also have uh, tubing running through the copper um, that can be liquid cooled. And so either water or oil could be circulated through that slab of copper in order to keep it cool. And so that's essentially how the target works. And this depiction here uh, essentially just shows that um, the higher the energy, the more forward peaked. Um, this slide was supposed to be before the flattening filters slide that would help explain why the flattening filters are like narrower for 6x, pointier for 10x, and even pointier for 18x. Um, this, is the, this is the reason why. Um, but we kind of lost that. So we lost this slide as well, but that's okay, we, we've covered it. So we've, we, we've covered everything now. Let's just go back to the beginning and put all of these slides in order. So here is our, the basic schematic that we showed at the very beginning, showing all of the components. So going from the top and the bottom again, right up at the top, we would have our target uh, in photon mode. If we want to be in electron mode, obviously we remove, um, um, we remove that target and we just leave a hole where the electron beam can pass straight through. Now bear in mind that the waveguide is, um, is, in a, is not going to be exposed to the air that's in the room. Uh, it's sealed so that the, what can be inside the waveguide is a dielectric gas, uh, SF6. And so there is some sort of window uh, right up at the top between, um, between that and the, uh, where the electron beam is. Um, the electron beam would then come down. Um, it would be kept in a vacuum right up. The beam as it goes through the bending magnets would be in a vacuum. So otherwise we would end up, those electrons would never make it from the actual waveguide up here to the bending magnet and then down. So all of that stuff has to be a vacuum. So there's a vacuum window right up at the top, but the beam goes through that vacuum window hits the target or doesn't, depending on whether it's photon or electron mode. So you've got a moving component up there. Uh, we have it, you can actually see what a demo of that target looks like. We have uh, one that we've pulled out of our machine. Um, next off the primary collimator, so that column of, that again is made of tungsten. Um, and uh, a lot of the neutrons that are produced in high Z, uh, sorry, in high energy beams are produced up there in that primary collimator. Uh, underneath that, you've got your flattening filter, all your scattering files for electrons. Underneath that, you may have your mirror, and then you've got your secondary. Uh, oh, sorry, missed the iron chamber. Up there, you've also got the iron chamber. Um, that's typically after the flattening filters. Um, how do we know it's after the flattening filters? If you compare the diameters, the diameter of the uh, flattening filter is smaller than the diameter of the iron chamber, so therefore the I, the flattening filter is further up, iron chamber is further down. So as the beam diverges, it gets wider and wider. Then underneath all of that, uh, we have produced a beam that is 
circular in cross section and needs to be truncated down to a rectangle, um, the largest of which is a 40 by 40 square. Uh, a lot of machines, um, the corners of that 40 by 40 field will have to be blocked off because the circle of the cross section of the beam is not quite big enough to fill completely a 40 by 40 square. And so the corners end up being blocked off. So that's definitely true of um, the Electro Precise. Um, don't think it's necessarily true of the Varian, but that might be one of the reasons why the, the head of the Varian machine is um, almost twice the size of that of an Electro. Um, but then you've got your collimation components and that's pretty much it. So uh, we hope you found this um, presentation useful and something that you can go back to. Uh, there is one last component that I said I would mention, um, but wasn't listed, and that's this. This, uh, this is one example of a thyrotron. So if you ever hear of thyrotron, and you go back through this presentation, and you say, he never mentioned thyrotron, um, all machines are going to have something like this. This is not a critical component of the accelerator, at least in the terms of what is needed to, um, to produce the, the high energies that we've talked about here. Um, it is a auxiliary piece, I suppose you could call it. Uh, but what essentially this is, is a high energy switch. So the machine obviously um, runs at very, very high voltages. And in order to trigger um, from the low voltage panel that you touch, right, when you touch the, the button to turn the beam on, there is not millions of volts going through that button. Um, there's maybe only five volts, 12 volts going through that button. And then that sends a signal to the high energy um, uh, box where all the high energy power supplies are stored. And the beam turns on by activating this switch. So when a signal hits this, um, very high energies, um, very high voltages and potentially high currents um, are turned on inside this. Uh, which is why it's in a vacuum tube. It's pretty old fashioned technology. These things have been around since um, maybe the 40s, definitely the 50s. Um, they're not made um, very much anymore, but for very high energy applications like we need, we still need stuff like this, um, even though it looks uh, archaic. This cannot be, um, semiconductors cannot really uh, replace this kind of stuff because a semiconductor, um, silicon device cannot uh, deal with millions of electron volts so or millions of volts so that's why we need that so that was just the last thing um, thyrotrons don't last very long or at least they don't last forever they might only last a few years in your machine and so it's not uncommon for these things to fail um, but when they do fail it's not that big of a deal in terms of what the work you need to do because because it's just a switch it cannot really have a significant effect on your um, beam properties um, but it is something that you'll hear about, so I just wanted to mention it. So if just one, someone says, yeah, the thyrotron has gone, that's what that is, and um, even though it's not like mentioned in most of these lectures. So, all right, well, we'll finish at that point. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was useful, and we'll see you again soon.